presentation of first images of the new world is made possible by a grant from Union Oil Company of California. The discovery of America represented a decisive turning point in the history of Europe. In a material sense, it represented an extraordinary amplification of the confines of the known world. A shifting of the axis of navigation and commerce from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. A diffusion in Europe of a new flora that changed its landscapes and all aspects of agriculture and diet. But above all, it represented a change of mentality, a transcending of scientific prejudices, and a new anthropological vision derived from the first direct contact with a human world, which had always been separated. Was Renaissance Europe responsive to the impact of the American discovery? To answer this question, one might say that Europe passed America through a selective screening process, which enabled it to reject images that were too far out of alignment with its own preconceptions. But Europe's responsiveness was hindered by other matters at home, which were more pressing. Europe was in a state of cultural, political, and religious upheaval. The Renaissance, the transitional movement in Europe between medieval and modern times, was blossoming. The Renaissance was marked by a humanistic revival of classical influence expressed in a flowering of the arts and literature and by the beginnings of modern science. A 16th century outgrowth of this was the Reformation, a religious campaign which challenged and ultimately rejected fundamental doctrines and practices of the Roman Catholic Church. From this cause, the Protestant churches sprang, and so did a century of internal wars in Europe. Two armed camps, polarized along religious lines, battled for the supremacy of the faith they upheld. demanded immediate attention. Newfound continents could wait. Nevertheless, when reports of the overseas discoveries were read in Europe, they were seen through eyes clouded by old world experience and tradition. In the first century after Columbus's discovery, these preconceptions were filtered through the lens of Renaissance humanism. Later, the lens of the Counter-Reformation lent its selectivity to the screening process. The humanists who celebrated the dignity of man viewed the new world as a terrestrial paradise where men lived simply and harmoniously with one another. The 17th century Counter-Reformation dwelt on the sinfulness of man and the need for a powerful state organization to restrain the forces of disorder. 
This movement regarded the native societies as crude and barbaric, requiring the intervention of a more civilized state to save them from chaos. Professor John Elliott. There seems to be some evidence to suggest that the humanist generation of the first half of the century was in certain important respects more responsive to the new world and to what it had to offer, both culturally and intellectually, than was its successor, the generation of the Counter-Reformation. In practice, the later 16th century evaluation of the post-conquest Indian may have been closer to the original than the often absurdly simplistic attitudes of humanists who saw in these newfound peoples paragons of innocence such as might have inhabited Eden before the fall of man. But this earlier and more open humanistic approach proved conducive to closer inquiry and to a greater degree of receptivity to the traditions and values of Amerindian society than the closed dismissive attitude of the later 16th century. The impact of the discovery was threefold, intellectual, economic, and political. It brought Europe into contact with new lands and peoples, and in so doing, challenged a number of traditional assumptions about geography, theology, history, and the nature of man. Europe approached her new discoveries with prejudice, curiosity, and caution. The discovery of America emphasize and strengthen certain elements in European civilization at the expense of others, rather than pointing Europe in totally new directions. There was a kind of resilience within Europe's cultural inheritance, which helped to cushion the shock of what at first sight appeared a devastating refutation of long-cherished beliefs. And I believe this happened because the Judeo-Christian and the classical traditions were themselves so rich and varied that they made it possible both to interpret and absorb a substantial part of what America had to offer without provoking a seismic shock in the European system. The shock was perhaps greatest in the area of geographical knowledge and experience. Although the classical geographical tradition was the springboard for the overseas explorations, it was the first and most decisive casualty of the voyages. As personal inquiry and investigation confronted myths with facts, so the old shibboleths fell. Again and again, that wonderful chronicler of the Indies, Gonzalo Fernández de Oviedo, insists, not without satisfaction, on the way in which the traditional cosmography has been discredited. The ancients had got it wrong. In the long run, personal experience proved to have more authority than authority itself. The replacement of speculation with observation was the first big step toward an accurate understanding of America. At the same time, America became the receptacle of the Europeans' disappointed dreams. An idyllic picture was painted which established Europe and America as antitheses. The old world was corrupt and the new world innocent. This representation made it very easy for Europeans to express their deep dissatisfaction with their own society. As soon as the process of comparison got underway, and it began almost from the first moment that Europeans set eyes on the Caribbean islanders, Europe had the opportunity to see itself in new and different perspectives. In observing America, it was in the first instance observing itself. And observing itself in one or other of two mirrors, each of which distorted even as it revealed. Either it could see in America its own ideal past, a world still uncontaminated by greed and vice, where men lived in felicity and prelapsarian innocence. Or, as occurred increasingly with the advance of the 16th century, it could see in America its actual past, a time when Europe's rude inhabitants were as yet untouched by civil manners or by Christianity. Neither image may have borne much relationship to America, past or present, but this was of less importance for European development than the mere fact that the images existed. The image was a European image which had little to do with the American reality. And as this reality started asserting itself, 
that image began to fade. Slowly, America emerged as an entity with her own personality and form, quite different from those of Europe. Her peoples, primitive, pure, and free, without laws or written tradition, impressed the Europeans with their harmony and simplicity. who even at times ate each other. How could the Europeans deal with this paradox? The Americans were seen as a primitive people in need of enlightenment. Conversion to Christianity was the first step in the civilizing process. But the English and Spanish colonists did not realize that the violence they committed in the name of the true faith was more detrimental to the natives than their own paganism. So much was done in the name of Christianity. Only 10 months before Columbus discovered America, Spain ended its most agonizing religious ordeal. For 700 years, the Moors of the Islamic faith had dominated Spain. The Reconquista, the reconquest of Spain by the Christians, had been hard fought and had lasted for centuries. The final expulsion of the Moors left an entire generation without an outlet for the burning religious zeal with which the Reconquista was fought. The new continents of America, with their millions of pagans, provided a new conquest for Spanish religious forces. The conversion of Americans presented few of the obstacles the Spanish had faced with the Moors. The Moors had been just as intent on converting Christians to the Islamic faith. In the New World, conquest and conversion were easily accomplished. Seeing such large numbers of peoples in spiritual darkness, the Europeans felt duty-bound to bring them the light. Spain had forces trained to accomplish it. The missionizing impulse, in turn, gave rise to colonization. The desire to spread the Christian faith may have been a great inducement to Spanish immigrants who burned with the religious fervor kindled by the Reconquista. Conquest and conversion were intertwined in both hemispheres, where European peoples were confronted by populations unlike any others they had previously encountered. The Indians were forced into a way of life which was harmful to them. They became physically weakened by the strain of the forced labor added to their own subsistence farming. Debilitated by the stress of conquest and the trauma of conversion, the Indians had no immunity to European diseases. They became the primary targets for the imported epidemics that ravaged the New World. The numbers speak for themselves. In Mexico, the pre-conquest population of 25 million sank to less than one and one quarter million in only 100 years. Under these circumstances, there was little resistance the natives could offer. Although the Europeans marveled initially at what they found, they soon set out to change it. New world cultures were almost wholly supplanted by a European system of values. Indian language, religion, and lifestyle were irrevocably altered. This contributed to the minimal impact the New World exerted on certain aspects of European life. 
most of the impact of the discoveries traveled from east to west. To Europe, America was like a child waiting to be molded into whatever shape a stronger power might give her. As a result, America became the testing ground for new thoughts on the nature of man, religious conversions, laws, and colonial policies. Some of these ideas were truly new, but others were merely resurrections of ideas dating back to ancient Greece. Aristotle's theory of natural slavery was one such antique idea that received new meaning in America. Throughout the Middle Ages, Aristotle's principles had been used to justify the feudal order in Europe in which there were definite social classes ranging from the aristocracy to the serfs. In a New World context, however, the status of all the inhabitants of America was considered inferior to that of the Europeans. An emperor like Montezuma was regarded as lowly as his servant. Those who followed these ideas were oblivious to the hierarchy within the native societies themselves. Equality, so often talked about, was never translated into daily practice. In fact, the seeds of racism were planted then. It became obvious that new political policies would be required to guide the emigrants and the colonial machinery in the new world. The only models they had were their home governments. In Spanish America, they chose to follow that model, while in English America, where there was initially less land and smaller numbers of people to govern, modifications were made on their model. The Spanish government tried to maintain absolute control over the colonies. Although there were local governments, the important decisions concerning the colonies were made in Spain by men who, more often than not, had never set foot in the New World. As new problems arose, another bureaucratic branch would be created to feed information back to Spain. Autonomy was discouraged by all possible means. This may be one reason independence from colonial rule came in Spanish America only after 300 years. The English government never tried to regulate the activities of her colonies as Spain did. Of course, the nature of those colonies and the emigrants who people them differed greatly from their southern counterparts. The settlers congregated in small enclaves where they could live without interference. As most of them had fled from religious persecution, this autonomy was dear to them. They set up town councils and assemblies to govern themselves, and matters concerning their communities were resolved there. Within 150 years, there evolved a spirit of self-sufficiency which grew stronger as the economy of the English colonies blossomed. When the British crown attempted to assert her control over these colonies in the 18th century, she was faced with people ready to fight for their independence. The American soil proved to be an excellent testing ground for Europe. It was also a much needed catalyst for new scientific knowledge and techniques. With the New World discoveries, there was a quickening in all the scientific fields that touched upon maritime activity. The development of new ships, nautical charts and instruments, and books filled with fresh data gave new life to the study of navigation. Peripheral areas like astronomy, cartography, and mathematics all profited from the discoveries. The fresh geographical data called the theories of the ancients into question and forced scholars to change their conception of the world. The impetus given to the nautical sciences encouraged continued exploration of the seas. Uncharted oceans were no longer the obstacles they once had been. And with this exploration, the axis of European navigation and commerce shifted from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. From the 16th century onward, an expansive tract of open seas became the new arena 
for old world political rivalries. Professor Jeffrey Simcox. The Atlantic does become gradually a focus for international conflict, certainly viewed from the perspective of maritime history. For most of the 16th and 17th centuries, the high seas and the new world were considered to be a separate region where European laws of war and treaties didn't really apply. And international law enshrined this in the dictum, no peace beyond the line, this idea that certain things are permitted beyond the line sort of a little west of the Azores and south of the equator. This diplomatic dualism had its convenient side, and undeclared wars would be allowed to smolder at a safe distance, so long as they seemed to offer some kind of ultimate profit. Three maritime trade routes developed among Europe, Africa, and America. The Silver Lifeline, running from Seville to Havana and other Caribbean ports, brought New World silver into Spain, in exchange for the commodities necessary to sustain life in the colonies. Of the three trade zones, this was the most important. Second of this was the triangular route that developed among Lisbon, Brazil, and Africa. Sugar and slaves were the valuable wares here. Last in importance, and the latest to develop, was the North Atlantic trade route which brought the English and French to the rich cod fisheries off the Newfoundland coast, then to the Mediterranean to exchange their catch for merchandise needed in their homelands. As the Atlantic moved gradually to center stage in European international relations, certain necessary changes took place in the conduct of policy. The growing dependence of the Spanish war machine on American bullion, particularly after about 1580, made the Seville route the natural target for opponents of Spain's military, uh, military dominance in Western Europe. That is why I think from the 1580s the, the Atlantic conflict begins to hot up. An early indication of what Spaniards could expect came in 1523, when part of Montezuma's treasure sent by Cortes to Charles V was captured off the Azores by a ship of French pirates. Soon the West Indies became a haven for buccaneers looking for possible vantage points for attacks on Spanish shipping. This testifies to the value of the resources that Spain gathered from the New World and over which she held a monopoly during the first century after the discoveries. As a donor of new products, America exerted her greatest influence over Europe. New World flora completely revolutionized the agriculture and diet of the Old World. Products like potatoes, maize, tomatoes, and tobacco left an indelible imprint on the European economy. A list of secondary products, including rubber, cod, cacao, cassava, vanilla, and cinchona, is almost inexhaustible. Certainly the first image of the New World as a land of magnificent lushness was well-founded. discovered, the desire to convert and the desire to know, that is, the ideals of Christianity and classical antiquity, were especially dynamic. These two ideals, so vital at the time, ensured that the immediate response to the newfound lands was more generous and positive than it otherwise may have been. Even so, the impact of the new world on the old was blunted by the cultural lenses through which the information was filtered. 
Old world experience and tradition colored how Europeans saw America. Distortions and misrepresentations abounded. But more than this, Europe was so preoccupied with her own state of affairs that American matters penetrated slowly. Geographically and otherwise, America was on the periphery. Only because of her novelty did she find her way into the European consciousness. But if the impact of the new world on the old was minimal, consider the impact of the old world on the new. Indian cities were destroyed and a way of life which had existed for centuries came to an end. The native population, decimated by war and disease, was replaced by a racially mixed, hybrid society. Indian languages disappeared and were replaced by English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. Native religions, too, were gone forever, superseded by Protestantism in the Northern Hemisphere and Catholicism in the Southern. And finally, the entire landscape of the continent was changed. Cities based on European models were built, and a way of life centered on subsistence farming was supplanted by economic exploitation on a grand scale. Old world ideals were implanted in new world soil and prospered there. Some Europeans conjectured that America had simply been waiting for this imprint. Whether or not this is true, she took it magnificently. The presentation of first images of the New World was made possible by a grant from Union Oil Company of California.